645. Welcome, Mark. It's good morning, Trinidad Tobago. Thank you for joining us this morning. It is Friday morning. We hope you have a great Friday morning. Please be careful on the roads as you go. We're expecting a bit of rain later on today, which is going to impair your vision. Our guest on set is the attorney rep who represented the attorney general in the uh, recent case and the ruling by Justice Kangaloo, which stated that, well, the Assembly, Tobago House of Assembly, uh, must take direction in terms of national policy from the central government. Martin George, good morning. Thank you for joining morning us this morning. You, Paul. Uh, give us a sense of, of how that case progressed, how long it was in the courts, and, and what, what, what did the Justice Kangaroo said in the final ruling? Okay, just before we touch on this, Paul, the decision of Trinbegonians to John, the comedian, British comedian, mm -hmm. I think people are overreacting tremendously. The man is a comedian, that's his job, mm -hmm. and I mean, I see nothing wrong with a television station selling airtime because that's what they do, that's their business, mm -hmm. they sell airtime, and you know, we, we must not take ourselves so seriously that we can't l laugh at ourselves. I see absolutely nothing wrong in the man's presentation. We make fun of people all the time, we make fun of small islanders, we make fun of how they speak, you know, we even refer to people from much larger islands and ourselves as small islanders, Jamaicans, Guyanese, and you know, we, we do it all the time. We, we had the mighty Sparrow who sang his song, you know, Philip My Dear, where mm -hmm. he poked fun at the Queen, the, the head of the, you, you know, the, the head of the British monarchy and her husband with the song Philip My Dear, mm -hmm. we, you know, so and Sparrow performed that song all over the world, you know, so the point is we, we, we must not think from that context of a small island, third world nation. We must see ourselves as first world and be able to appreciate and embrace all these things. And I think even Mr. Warner, his approach to it, his reaction, I, I think he, he needs someone to, to give him some PR advice, seriously. Because yeah, in other PR words, advice at this stage. Yeah, no, 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 seriously. <laughs> even, no, even in relation to that, because he comes out as, you know, so antagonistic and angry and bitter, you know, he should laugh at that and laugh it off and put an end to it, you I, know. I don't by, think, I don't think the one is, is in a position to laugh at but, very much these days. No, no, no. But uh, and, I mean, you see, the point is you still have to make the best of the scenario. And by his reaction, I think he has just validated the comedian's, you know, expose. You know, so I think he should have taken another approach and just, you know, said, well, the man is a comedian and just leave it there. Uh, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, uh, Unlikely, <laughs> given the circumstance, Mr. Warner finds himself <laughs> now. Yeah, he, he, he hasn't been able to manage that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and even outside Parliament, you know, his reaction to the foreign media, come on, you are getting an opportunity to speak to the world, stand up, say your piece, say your case, you know. Be, be very calm and logical about it. And don't, don't, don't appear to have this hostile approach to the foreign media because the point is when you in the limelight and in the spotlight these were the same media people you embraced and you know so therefore you must still manage the transition with a sense of dignity calm and aplomb regardless of what inner turmoil you may be feeling uh, to make us of assembly what, yes. what did just <laughs> essentially say break it down for us in terms of because it, the, the the relationship between the THA uh, tr through the act uh, and the central government has been so uh, widely interpreted over the years leading to the actual case now well paul the interesting thing about this matter is that we went back and we analyzed the genesis of the 1996 tha act we even went back to the original 1980 act and we went into hansard the records of parliament we we got the the contributions from the various speakers you know in terms of what they said in the parliament to understand where they were coming from. And the unfortunate reality is that Tobagonians never got what they thought they were getting with that 1996 THA Act. And you see, the point is, um, I saw Mr. London's reaction last night on the television, and he seems quite angry and upset. But you see, being overly emotional about things like that doesn't really carry us anywhere. We need a logical, level-headed approach to resolve this issue. And that's what the courts have done. What they have, what the judge did, she went through the law, she analyzed the position, and she basically has indicated that, look, <laughs> to paraphrase our president, the powers that you think you have, you don't have. Mm -hmm. And the powers that you have are things that you don't really, mm -hmm. you know, have when you look at the legislation. So therefore, it is now for us to understand this, accept it, and see, well, maybe there's need for legislative intervention to fix the things. But as it stands, what does it mean? in terms of the, the remit of the central government, is it only policy and the THA operationalizes, or is it much wider than that 
in terms of the remit of the central government okay. from the interpretation of I'll this give you, I'll give you the example. The genesis of this matter stemmed from the Department of Agriculture, Marine Affairs, Marketing and the Environment. Mm -hmm. Marketing, Marine Affairs and the Environment in the Tobago's of Assembly. They had applied to central government for release of monies through the Green Fund, mm -hmm. right? Several, I think it was hundreds of millions of dollars they had applied for to access that. And they said that this was part of their reforestation um, plan mm -hmm. for Tobago. What central government basically said is said, hold up. Mm -hmm. In terms of things like reforestation, we have a national policy. So whatever you wish to do, must accord with the national policy. In other words, you cannot go off on your own and decide, well, this is your policy and you are implementing mm -hmm. it in Tobago. Whatever policies you must implement must be in accordance with the national policy. And if there's a conflict, then the cabinet's decision on such matters takes precedence. Mm -hmm. Now, it is really a wake-up call for each and every Tobagonian who has been walking around deluding themselves, thinking, well, we have control over the areas in the fifth schedule. Because the fifth schedule sets out 32 areas over which the THA has control. You have, um, they have finance, tourism, agriculture, marine affairs, all these things are nicely set out and laid out there. And for years... But, if, but even that, with that said, they should not be in conflict with the central government that's, overarching policy that's in any particular sector. That's the point. So in other words, where you thought you had overriding control, you still must be subject to the dictates of cabinet when it comes to issues of policy mm -hmm. guiding how you implement your authority over those areas. So it really is something that, and when you look back at it, you look back at section 75 of the constitution where it gives cabinet that power and authority mm -hmm. in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. It's not just Trinidad, it's Trinidad, Trinidad, Trinidad and, and Tobago. That's correct. So therefore you now realize that the THA Act is subordinate to the overriding power of cabinet as enshrined in the Constitution. Does that then mean, will I be correct in interpreting it, that cabinet says the overriding policy in any particular sector, agriculture, tourism, etc. Uh, but the THA is now charged with the responsibility of operationalizing That's with correct. the budget given by the central government in that particular segment within the ambits of that policy direction? That is exactly the point. And in other words, the THA cannot see, look, I am ignoring the central government's policy in this area, say for instance tourism, mm -hmm. and I am going to do my own thing if mm -hmm. there's a conflict. If it's in confluence, there's no problem mm -hmm. at all. But if there's a conflict, then the THA is still subordinate to the cabinet policy on the issue. Well, one can also infer by Mr. London's response that the THA will appeal, that he understands the gravity or the gravitas of this ruling in further operations of the THA, wouldn't you say? Because if it were a mild or not as intense a ruling in terms of how the THA must move forward, he would not have, there would not be a need to, to No, to, no, no, it, to it, it really, it really, I tell you, it, it is a phenomenal exposition of the law and it really is a stark reminder and a wake up call for everyone who would have previously thought that the THA really had these wide ranging powers. In other words, basically notwithstanding what is set out in the act and nicely laid out there. And that's why I tell you it was important for us to go back mm -hmm. to Hansard. We saw the contributions from I think Mr. Roger Boynes, he was an MP then. Mr. Ramesh Maraj made a contribution. You know, um, there was a contribution by Mr. N. A. R. Rob A. N. R. Robinson. Mm -hmm. You know, so the point is we looked at all those things and we saw what was said, we saw what was intended, and really it was not a scenario because the argument for the THA was that the way the act is worded, they were of the view that it is notwithstanding cabinet's directives, they can do ABC. Does this also now mean that many of the decisions that may have been taken in the past couple of years by the THA with regard to sport, tourism, etc., may may now need final acquiescence from the, central, from the cabinet in terms of the, the, the cabinet saying, well, you know, this falls within our policy direction based on this new, this new ruling. Well, the point is cabinet can look at things and say, well, look, um, this is what you did. We wish to indicate that our policy is 
in contravention, they can. But I would imagine that the effect of the ruling, really, the, the, the thrust and government of it is going forward, mm -hmm. that it is clear now. Because, you see, the point is the THA, they're the ones who brought the matter to court. Unfortunately, mm. they're the ones, had, had they left it alone, I guess everyone may have continued in the mm. gray area, but now it's set out in black and white. No one can say they're in any doubt as to where you stand in terms of your relationship. So, so would it be correct to say then that now people interpreted this whole thing wrong for many, for many, many years? Well, there was a 19, there was a case before whereby it was brought to the attention. This was when they were trying to locate um, the psychiatric unit up at the Scarborough Hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was challenged because, in other words, the THA at the time, and, but this was based on the 1980 Act, they sought to challenge that to say, well, look, um, you know, the minister cannot override THA's policy because they were saying, look, the Minister of Health cannot locate a psychiatric unit up at the Scarborough Hospital, etc., mm -hmm. and they had their objections. That case went to court, and the judge there, even interpreting the 1980 Act, said, look, you mm -hmm. must still be subject to the policies of cabinet. Put, put up in there, we're going to continue our discussion. We're going to take a break for our headline news. Our attorney, no Martin George, is our guest. Stay with us. 7 a.m. newscast is coming up next. Minutes after seven, welcome back. It's GMTT. Good morning, Trinidad Tobago for today, Friday. Welcome to the weekend. Thank you for joining us this morning. This coming Sunday at 11 a.m., you can join us for Political Capital. We'll be sharing with you uh, some of the uh, interview that Larry Lumsden did with uh, former Prime Minister Bastia Prende. And also, we'll be focusing on uh, what the 10th Parliament has been able to achieve and, and also uh, what we can expect as the Parliament closes or, or is dissolved this coming Wednesday, the 17th. We're also waiting with, you never know, the Prime Minister indicated yesterday during the post-cabinet press briefing, we may have an election day later on today, maybe. So we're looking out for that. We'll continue following that story uh, as uh, C News normally does. Our guest on set is attorney at law who represented the attorney general in this groundbreaking uh, delivery by Justice Kangaloo on the remit of the Tobago House of Assembly in terms of its relationship with the central government. Does this now Martin George reopened the conversation about internal self-governance and the amendment of that 1996 uh, Assembly, Tobago House of Assembly Act. Well, clearly it does. And it's something that I think really was a lost opportunity. You would recall shortly after this government came into power, they actually tried to draft legislation to say, well, look, let's try and deal with the legislative changes. But for whatever reason, the opposition didn't appear to be, um, you know, interested at the time. Now, of course, Mr. London is um, going all over Tobago and he is, you know, trying to re ignite the issue but right. you had the perfect chance shortly after the government came into power because they did give a commitment to try to deal with that issue and they actually were um, you know in the process of trying to do so they had a constitution commission whereby um, I, Dr. Hamid Ghani myself and Ms. Crystal Moore we went around the country both in Trinidad and Tobago we canvassed views on you know the draft um, legislation and you know but the thing is that the the opposition did not appear supportive at the time and when you look at that that would have given you tremendously wider powers than what the present act gives so therefore you know you you have basically taken several steps backwards you've taken tobago backwards and then now saying well you know just on the eve of election you say well let's revive this issue let's try to move forward when you had that golden opportunity and you you basically had a missed opportunity but well, many have suggested that that uh, in particular and many other issues had become political footballs with people not wanting to give the other side credit for championing 
uh, the changes and possibly having the changes instituted during their tenure, being, of course, the, the PNM in the Tobago House of Assembly under Mr. Orville London and, and the People's Partnership Government as it stands now. And especially at, at that time, if I remember correctly, it was just before the House of Assembly elections right. uh, or the, yes. in the lead up to that. But yes. because the issue has been a, a, a point of contention for some 40 years, how important is it now and, and, and now that it's once again in the national conversation? Do you think we can move forward in this or it will, it, will it remain a political football because it does mean, if I'm not mistaken, need a special majority. Of course. And the thing is, Paul, unfortunately, I have always taken a very different view on this whole idea. I have tried to speak out and urge Tobagonians to try to attain financial independence because I think with that, everything else follows. What, what does that because mean? That, in they, the they sense that their own generating their own revenue? Or, or? Right, from that perspective. Because when you look at what they call the Tobago economy, it is really a, a, a farce. It, 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 there's no real economy in Tobago. Every year, you basically stretch your cap to, towards Port of Spain, they fill it with three billion dollars, and you basically spend with very little accountability. You, you saw the Auditor General's report where they said that look, several of the items they asked the THA produce your, you know, a, accounting for this, that, the other. They have not done so. So basically, that's not an economy. That, mm -hmm. That's basically a welfare state. That that's really how Tobago has been functioning. So therefore, what is needed is to build up the economic base of Tobago. Let the persons in the in the island become self finance and self-sustainable, then once you get to that level, of course that will take some time, but mm -hmm. you see the, the mindset has to change. Instead of, you, for 40 years you, you're like the Israelites, wandering around, around in the desert, lost forever. I have said repeatedly to Tobagonians, Mr. London cannot and will not give you internal self-government. But why do you he, say he's that? Not, because the point is, the very political football issue that you, you've, you've mentioned, once you have that, and I mean, it, it seems so that the parliament has been it's Mr. destined to be Mr. even closer. Mr. London has, has had the benefit of having uh, a PNM central government Thank under Mr. You. Manning and, and, he didn't do it and then. Uh, a Tobago House of Assembly PNM run assembly. And he didn't do it then. So, therefore, if he couldn't get it then, you really think that he can get it now in the last days um, before an election? It's not, it's not possible. But it's an emotive issue, and therefore, it's a good platform for him to churn up the passions of Tobagonians. And I keep saying, let us be logical, let's be realistic, let's be practical. There are ways to achieve things, but if you are just emotional about it, then you will never get it done because you're just guided by your passions mm -hmm. and not by your logical thinking, you know. So therefore, I'm saying, look, let's still keep the legislative agenda alive in terms of pressing for legislative change but don't let that be your only focus try to develop the skill set of the average Tobagonian. Try to develop the young people, the entrepreneurs, the business people. Try to create more opportunities for them to be self-sustaining and self-financing. Once you get that then you will now be able to say well hey listen I am generating enough revenue whereby it's clear. I can call my own shots. Thank you. You know, it's like when you're growing up as a young person, you know, as a, you know, you're living in your parents' house, basically and you they're have giving to, you money. That's you right. They're giving you money. You have, right. But once you start working and earning your own money, you have your own job, you can take your own decision and say, hey, listen, I am ex exercising my own independence. I am moving out. I'm going to rent mm -hmm. a place. I'm going to buy a house, that kind you of become, thing. You can be and truly that's independent. the simple analogy I have given to Begonians all the time. I said, listen, stop focusing on this, you know, running behind, you know, central government, begging, 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 give me, please, give me, please, but give that me, takes, please. But that takes infrastructure development and, and a little bit of vision, but we're out of time, unfortunately. Mark. Yes, Thank you so much. Always I appreciate pleasure, your time Paul. coming in. And uh, we're coming to Tobago soon, so we'll let you know more. All right. Good sure. morning, to you <laughs> and other shows. So we're going to take a break and come back with more. This is GMTT Friday. Stay with us. Welcome back to Rent Tobago. We're going to go straight away to our next interview segment. We're discussing a controversial topic of the day, uh, the latest allegations of marijuana fine at the Prime Minister's residence. So many persons are chiming in on this debate. We've got the PCA jumping in as well. 
some legal mind saying, of course, the, it's a non-issue. The Prime Minister was not in the country. It doesn't affect her. We have with us uh, Martin George at Tidiot Law who will help us understand what's happening. Thank you for joining us, hey, Good morning to you, Larry, and good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. And I hope you, you're not lumping me among those who are here just chiming in. No, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But let's begin with the... the, the, the you're a legal mind. From the, on the face of this, what do you make out of this topic? Well, the point is, you, you look at it both from a legal perspective, and I would imagine you'd also look at it from a simply social and human relations perspective. And I think in terms of the legal perspective, there are quite a few issues that are arising because one has to consider, first and foremost, whether there was some deliberate attempt to prevent a possible criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, I've made it clear, and I'll say it again, Larry. There appears to be absolutely no credible evidence that could link anything that would have been found there to say that it was in the possession and control or ownership of the home owner. Mm -hmm. And we must be careful in terms of these things because, you know, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, we love to rush to judgment and, you know, jump to conclusions. Yes. And I've used a simple example, which I will use again, if you will permit me. If you are doing construction, say for instance, at your home, yeah. and you have a contractor who has lots of workers in and out of your premises, you, the homeowner, you are not in full control of your premises at those times. Correct. So therefore, if at some point during that construction, some substance is found by a police officer somewhere on your grounds or on your premises, then it's difficult for anyone to seek to saddle mm -hmm. you with knowledge, control, and therefore possession of that. Mm -hmm. and, and you, and, and now, that, that's my position yes. on that aspect. There's another aspect of it, however. If something has been found, has been brought to the attention of the police, then the question that follows is, what did they do thereafter? In other words, I've heard quite a bit of misinformation and lots of obfuscation being bandied about on the issue. I've heard persons who I think ought to know better suggest that you know, no, nothing could have been done further until it was tested forensically to determine that it's marijuana. That's not how the process works. Mm -hmm. If you have police officers going out on a raid, say for instance, mm -hmm. um, like you saw in the newspapers yesterday, they had a raid um, in Point Fortin, and then I think two days ago they had a raid in Erin, mm -hmm. where they destroyed hundreds of marijuana trees. Now, the police officers, due to their training, knowledge, and experience, they would be entitled to form a preliminary opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's what they go with. You, you can't go out and you see hundreds of marijuana trees and then you say, well, you know, I have to go and get it forensically tested before I can take action to destroy it. Or if it is that you find, you know, what appears to be looking like marijuana in a bag or something that you will say, look, I can't sees it because it's not forensically right. tested. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It works along the principle that based upon the training, the experience, and the expertise of your officers, they are able to form a preliminary opinion. And it's just an opinion. Mm -hmm. But based on that opinion, that is what you lay your charges on. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the thing, you see. So w once you talk in marijuana, Mm -hmm. Right? That's how it works. So therefore, the police officers, they would see it and they would say, look, they found a plant-like substance, right, right resembling mm -hmm. that of marijuana, mm -hmm. or they may say resembling that of cannabis sativa, right. you know, and therefore, based on that, you then proceed to lay your charges. What happens is that once the charges are laid, then the police officer has to now take the responsibility to send that to the Forensic Science Center. And in the course of that matter, proceeding through the courts, that report is supposed to come back. And then now, depending on wh whichever way that report goes, that report now forms part of the evidence. Yes. So if the Forensic Science Center confirms that this plant-like material contains <coughs> the material cannabis sativa, then that report would say so, and that report would now be tendered. Now you have the
the two. You have the opinion based on the officer's observation now backed up by a scientific right. document. But you can't wait to get that scientific document before you charge people. The, the, the practical reality is that our forensic science center sometimes takes two years right. to you know, uh, make that type of analysis. So, so therefore, there, there appears fundamentally yeah. to have been some flaw in the procedure right. which was adopted um, subsequent to this fine. So let me ask you then, and it's a question I've heard a few days uh, since this has been happening, do you suspect that a lot, is, or a lot has been made out of nothing uh, or is it a, a concern? Why is it a, uh, you know? Well, I wouldn't say a lot has been made out of nothing because if you are talking about circumstances where it appears that there's been a clear failure of your police procedures in that regard and then listening to the commissioner mm -hmm. i think he himself was you know struggling to find words to explain the predicament yes. in which the police service has found itself because it appears that there and i mean this is certainly the public's perception that there's some sort of disconnect or information gap between the officers below him mm -hmm. and relevant information reaching up to the commissioner. Yes. And it, it created quite an embarrassing situation, you know, because the point is, at one stage he was saying, look, there's no report, and then, you know, the very next day you have to come back and basically, you know, recant. And, you know, so it, it never makes a commissioner look yes. good. In fact, um, I saw the police service launched yesterday their initiative um, called the Mystery Customer. Yes. Uh, you know, which is, you know, designed to try and improve the level of service. But maybe the commissioner may have to launch a mystery officer program <laughs> to find out who is the officer yeah. responsible for not communicating this information to him. Mm -hmm. And there's the other aspect of the matter, which I have not heard anyone address in any credible or sensible manner as yet, the question of where is the exhibit? Yes. Where's that specimen? Who has it? Who has had control and custody of it? What's the state and status of that exhibit? Because I understood the commissioner yesterday to be saying, well, the focus is on the exhibit and to determine its nature and, you know, yes. you know what, what exactly it is. Okay, then I think you ought to tell the public where is the exhibit? Who has it? Where has it been? Why has it not been sent through the channels mm -hmm. for that type of testing? You know, so what has happened in terms Since of your then. procedure? And yeah. I'll tell you why this is important. Because for the average citizen, if they see that procedures are applied differently for them, then they must raise questions. So in that regard, we must never brush aside these situations to say, well, look, too much is being made of it. Because the procedure must be applied equally across the board for all citizens. And I think that's where the concern of the public would arise. You've made a very valued point in terms of the police officers. Launch, well, jokingly, of course, that launching another unit <laughs> <laughs> to look at them, but uh, they are going to investigate. The PCA uh, has indicated that their intent. What right, yes. I, I see uh, Mr. David West um, of the PCA has indicated that they would be launching their investigation into the matter. And of course, this is fully within their remit. It's within their constitutional mandate and within their statutory authority. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that their investigation should be interesting because um, something that not all members of the public understand or appreciate, the PCA's in investigators do not comprise any police officers at all. all right. So they stay away from using police to investigate Correct. police. And that's a very important aspect. So basically, it's along the lines of something like an internal affairs yes. unit. But it's just that this is performed by an external agency. Yeah. So it would be quite interesting to see what is the result of that type of um, investigation. Because clearly, someone has dropped the ball. And you've basically embarrassed your commissioner. Mm -hmm. Because there's no 
th th there's no nice or palatable way to put that across, you know, except to say that, look, the officers below him have created an embarrassing imbroglio mm -hmm. in which he finds himself embroiled now. My final question, is there a case, uh, you're a legal mind, uh, <laughs> if I was, a, if, if the client if it came to you and, and this is the circumstance, uh, they found marijuana in my house, if I am the Prime Minister, is there a case there to defend? Well, I thought I had dealt with that <laughs> at the start well, no, I, with you, the you examples have, that saying, I used. I'm saying that with, with all that the investigations now coming out, is, should, is there something to be worried about now that it's taken this turn? Well, again, I thought I had already answered that because at the end of the day, Larry, as I said, if it is that there is no question of connecting you to the issue of possession mm -hmm. and control, then for you, there's no issue. Of course, there's the, as I said, the social aspect and the public relations aspect whereby maybe it ought to have been revealed that, look, there was maybe you could term it a security breach. Yes at the residence and therefore you will say you'll beef up security and then you will try to launch investigations to find out through whom this substance came on the premises and I thought that if it had been dealt with that way from the get-go mm -hmm. we would not be facing this right. you know entire brouhaha right. over the issue. I enjoy it. Thank you very much. For it's always a pleasure out. and enjoy your weekend all of Trinidad and Tobago. Happy Father's Day to you. <laughs> Thank you. All right we're going to take a short break when we come back we've got much more for you right here and good morning Trinidad and Tobago.